My name is Dr. Tom Bennett. I'm with the Battleship New Jersey and Kane University Oral History Project. Today is um, June 17th, the year 2005. We're aboard the Battleship New Jersey in the TV studio at, in Camden, New Jersey. Today I'm interviewing Mr. Raul Gonzalez, who served aboard the Battleship New Jersey from December 1968 to December 1969. He served in turret two as a gunner's mate, uh, working in specific areas including the powder room, shell decks, and also the gun pit. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, thanks so much for talking with us today. Thank you. Let's start off and, and tell us, how did you become involved with the Battleship New Jersey? Well, I was on board the USS Holland in Charleston, South Carolina. That was my first station. And uh, during that time, that was a ship that just sat in the harbor servicing uh, nuclear submarines. And I wasn't getting the experiences that I wanted um, traveling. And a roster came out for people to volunteer for duty on board the USS New Jersey and that they would uh, select the folks that were on there to the, from the crowd of, of people that were uh, you know, volunteering. And so I volunteered for the ship and then I received uh, notice uh, that I was picked among a, a number of individuals throughout the fleet as a sailor for the uh, USS New Jersey and then my uh, first uh, assignment was to report to San Diego for training with a number of other individuals and then from there we would continue on into Camden to pick up the ship and then help finish reconditioning it and take her out for her maiden voyage. Why do you think you were picked to uh, serve aboard the battleship New Jersey? Well, for one I probably had a high school education or you know, degree from high school. Um, it seemed to be more intelligent than most other people at the time and at the time uh, the Navy was looking for people that were uh, of a higher caliber which was very interesting because when I joined the crew it was a mixture of high school graduates and a lot of uh, college graduates at the time so that it was a upper scale uh, crew. Um, were you specifically trained as a gunner's mate before you came aboard the ship or what was your uh, Actually, specialty before? My specialty is before I was a regular seaman I'm working on a deck cruise for the bosun mates on board the Holland. And then when I came over to the New Jersey, my assignment was turret number two. And I was to be trained in, in the gun rooms and in the, in the gun uh, pits and so forth. And for the historical record, what type of ship was the Holland? The Holland is a submarine tender. And she was uh, sitting at the Charleston nuclear uh, sub uh, station. And she specifically uh, serviced the nuclear subs that came in off of uh, duty. Um, what type of training did you go through uh, before you arrived on the Battleship New Jersey? In the Battleship New Jersey, we did a lot of training in fire control, damage control, water control, flooding, repairs, um, a, a number of scenarios in regarding um, how to put out a fire, actually going into a, a fire pit, a uh, fuel tank on fire, opening the doors, and everyone would take turns at the head of the of the, of the nozzle and then just go in and attack the fire. Uh, get used to dealing with oil fires and any type of nature. Going into smoke rooms, how to survive in a smoke enclosed area. Uh, again, in a flooded compartment, how to deal with leaks, how to plug leaks with simple things as taking a t-shirt off and doing short-term patches until you can get uh, the major uh, pieces of equipment into place in order to control the, the damage. So it required a lot of thinking on the spot, being very creative in how to solve problems. And it really, the training involved was problem solving. How to solve in situations under pressure. And they, they like to put you under pressure. Uh, you learn how to shoot guns, again, uh, do electrical work, some basic work in electricity, because again, on the gun pits themselves, it's a combination, and the turrets is a combination of both electrical, hydraulic systems, regular manual labor, it's a combination of all functions there, plus uh, learning just basics about uh, weapons. Uh, how were you specifically trained on 16-inch guns? 16-inch guns were different. That is like artillery. I, I associated with heavy artillery in, in, in the Army. Uh, dealing with powder bags. Each powder bag is 100 pounds, moving canisters around, uh, just learning the basics about what to do and what not to do with, with the powder bags, how not to drop them, uh, handling uh, weapons of that sort. 
uh, dealing with the shells. The shells were 2,000 pounds. How do you maneuver a shell around in a deck uh, with hydraulics and ropes and, and hoist and so forth? Uh, basically, looking at just the mechanics of a gun. And really, an artillery is just like a gun, only it's a bigger piece with a bigger piece of ordnance going through. When they trained you on this, did they train you on the battleship, or did they have a specific training site with the, uh, in effect, recreation of a battleship uh, uh, turret and, and decks below? In the San Diego scenario, most of that was more classroom training and just and actually just playing with actual guns just to learn the basics of the gun. But on the job was right inside. Once we got on board the ship, you actually got right involved with the turret itself. Uh, there were people that you were learning off from. There were veterans from World War II and the Korean War who had service, uh, served on the ship previously and had come in to help not only take the ship out but to serve. So they were the core group uh, ahead of you and you learned through the veterans. And what were some of the things they passed on to you, uh, some of the little inside bits of information that are not in the textbook, so to speak? They passed on all the tricks of the trade that they learned. I mean, uh, how to handle moving bags of powder through, how to handle the shells, how to move the shells around, what is the best way. The, the book tells you this, but the folks, uh, these old timers, just pass down the little tricks of the trade, how to, the, to untangle uh, a shell if it gets jammed up and as it moves up the elevator, how do you get it out of there without panicking and uh, what do you look for and, and so forth. So there was a number of things. It's probably 37 years ago right now, so I can't remember a lot. By any chance, do you recall any one specific incident where the textbook said do Y and the men aboard the ship who had served in World War II said really do X, that works better? Uh, mostly, it, it came into more of the replenishment at sea when we were bringing in uh, ordnance, because we always transferred our ordnance at sea. I mean, we have a ship come alongside, and then you would just watch it, the powder and the shells come across, and then you have to get them down the passageways, and uh, how you move the, the powders through, and how you have to do it very quickly. So there was a way of learning how to move, say, canisters of three bags of uh, powder they weighed about 300 pounds in total with the canister, maybe 325, and then getting this through, and you're probably putting about 100 or 200 of those canisters in each little gun room, and you have to do it very quickly. So the old timers would show us how to get those through, get it down and work in a team type of fashion, and then you just guide it down very quickly, get it over, put it on the hoist, move it up, and then have one person you know, hoist it up, and a lot of manual power there as well. So. Just something I've wondered about when I've interviewed people, um, especially during the served on the Vietnam period uh, since a lot of people have forgotten how to operate a battleship. Um, could you have operated the gun turrets as effectively as your crew did without the World War II people helping you? In time we did. In time we did because after, it didn't take us very long uh, with the old timers on there because there was very few handful. There were maybe one or two of, of those folks uh, spread out throughout the ship. But yes, once we got the, the handle of uh, operating the turret and, and all the mechanisms, we were as good as the old timers, and of course we continued to learn, but you respected them, and, and that was the most important thing. Did they stay with the ship when it went to sea, did they get off after they finished their training cycle? With you? No, actually they, they went through all the ways with us to Vietnam as well. A lot of them stayed on there, and uh, when they came back, uh, some of them took her back up into, uh, at the first time uh, for malt ball up in uh, Washington. Talk to us a little bit about your experiences when you first came to the battleship in New Jersey. What did you see and what work had to be done on the ship? But what were your experiences when you first approached the ship for the first time? First approached the ship, it was like a mess. <laughs> there were cables all over the place running from uh, the docks aboard the ships. There was a lot of welding going on, last minute welding, a lot of uh, scaffolding coming with that was still up, uh, painting, you, got, you had a lot of uh, primer paint all over the place. Uh, the decks were terribly, a, a terrible mess with, uh, with all the ashes and so forth. It just looked like chaos going on board and you're thinking like, how am I supposed to keep myself clean, my uniforms clean, and so forth, because of course part of being aboard a Navy ship is cleanliness and appearance. And going through and maintaining that while you're doing your work. Um, so that, that was just, first thing was to step back and take a look at the scenario. But the other side of it was that there was a hidden beauty of the ship, the silhouette as she sat there at the dock, because you could see under, 
underneath through all of this that once you remove all the cables and everything, the ship was was an effective, was a very, uh, I'll call it a beautiful piece of art, very magnificent to look at. And what was your task when the ship was being uh, refitted again, ready to go to sea? I was right away put into a turret number two, that was my assignment, and from that point on we went down. My first assignment was down in the powder rooms. Uh, <clears throat> my first, uh, the petty officer, I'll pre always remember his name is Pappy Vondelin. He was aboard the California in Pearl Harbor and he had been aboard the New Jersey in the Korean War and so he came through. So he was our expert and he knew the ship inside and out and so working with him there was a few of us assigned to the powder decks and we, our job was to get the powder decks in, in, into uh, shape, get them all painted up, scrape off the paint, old paint, get on the new paint, grease up the, uh, the hoist, the, the bars, everything else that was supposed to be around the area and get the place really cleaned up because it was just shambles. You were still cleaning this this uh, whole scenario up and then getting it ready uh, and testing out the equipment to make sure that everything worked properly uh, beforehand. So we all had our assignments and the, the powder room was my first area of experience and that was my first duty just to go through and get that place in shape and there's quite a few of them. In your opinion, was a ship put away properly? Uh, was it uh, covered with grease where it needed to be covered with grease, repaired, uh, vented properly when you came aboard? I, the ship was in fairly good condition. So I thought it was, I thought in itself it was done correctly. And, and multiple ships, you, you see them sitting in a harbor and they look like they're rusting hulks, but reality on the outside is just the exterior. You could always chip off the old rust, uh, scrape it off and then repaint it. But it's the inside is what's really um, uh, important. And the ship was very in very good shape. And just one other question, as, as we're, you're being retrained, you're being trained on a battleship in Jersey, the person who was in charge of you, had he been called out of retirement or was he still on active duty at the time? He was still on active duty. He probably was probably hitting his 30 year mark or so and he was maybe thinking about retiring but with the reactivation of the New Jersey that was more of an incentive for him to keep on going as long as he could. You mentioned he had been aboard the USS California, an old battleship. I believe at Pearl Harbor. Yes. Uh, did he ever talk to you about Pearl Harbor at all? Just a little bit, just a little bit about it and his his experience and uh, scenario. But he never really dwelled on it too much. Yeah, you could tell it was a little bit more painful for him to go back into that. So, but he, he did say uh, what he experienced a little bit at the time of the attack and what he had to do, and that was about the end of it. What did he say? Do you recall? Uh, he was. Uh, he wasn't a gunner's mate at the time, he was in the kitchen, but when the attack occurred, you know, everybody just went to battle stations and he was assigned to one of the, the guns and he went up that way and there was just so much chaos and bombing and so forth that, you know, he was probably one of the lucky few that uh, wasn't injured at the time. Do you, did he tell you what happened to the California? Did it sink? I'm not sure. I can't recall. I know the California was hit. I know a number of them were sunk. I, I'm not sure if the California was one of them. I think it was. You know, my history is a little bit uh, off right now. Now, let's go back to the battleship in New Jersey. <clears throat> How long did it take to get the ship uh, ready for sea? Well, the ship had been, they started renovating probably around the fall of 90, of, uh, I'm sorry, of 67. I came on board right after in January, uh, February of uh, 68, and it had been going on since then. We in turn, once I got on board to, to New Jersey after my, our stint in San Diego, sat there and, and worked on it for about a couple more months and then around April or May is when we actually took her out, of, out to sea, had her ready to go for her first uh, sea trials. And once that was completed successfully, then we went right into the recommissioning. And talk a little bit about the sea trials. Uh, what is your experience, especially in Tur 2? Tur 2, being on board a battleship is a much different experience than being aboard a submarine tender and going out to sea. Uh, going out, we went through all the maneuvers, uh, put the ship through all sorts of uh, 
sets and turns, uh, got the guns working. We actually fired one of the guns to make sure everything was working correctly. We went through all kinds of drills on uh, moving powder around, uh, moving shells, loading the, uh, the, the, the hoist to take them up to the gun rooms, practicing not actually loading the gun, but we did try each of the turrets to shoot one of their guns just to make sure that that, that was actually uh, functioning as well. Uh, at the time, we also had five inch along the side, so those uh, as well uh, shot their guns just to make sure everything was functional. Uh, going around, we were probably out for a couple of days, and when we came back in, I think the, the way to show that it had been successful trial is you take the broom and you put it at the top uppermost mass. I think it's upside down. And that just shows that when she comes into port that the ship had successfully passed sea trials and she was ready to, to be recommissioned. Did you have any run into any problems within turret two and the powder room and the shell room down below? That any major things that had to be repaired or updated or changed in any way? No, more of it was reconditioning. A lot of this was reconditioning. Once we got a recondition, then really from that point on it became more of a of the nature of maintaining it and keeping the equipment, you know, solid and getting parts. But th it, it was amazing though that there were ample parts available. And some had to be recon some parts had to be remade. And of course there were certain new things that were brought up to speed. A lot of new equipment was put on board the ship at the time. You took out some of the old anti-aircraft guns and so forth, you didn't need those anymore. But the five inchers that you kept on, on board and the, and the three turrets as well. Uh, the ship now is commissioned, ready for sea, and off you go to Vietnam. Yes. Talk a little bit about the trip over to Vietnam, what you recall of the men's morale and attitude, because the ship is now going to war. What's going through the crew's mind? What's going through your mind? Everybody's excited. I mean, we're here on pulling out of Philadelphia and our first cruise, and we know we're going over to, um, to Long Beach. We're going to go up to San Francisco first and then come back down to our, our home port in the West Coast, which would be Long Beach. But taking this ship down was an exciting adventure for all of us because, again, most of the crew was quite young. I was 19 at the time. There were people that were about the same age, some were. 20, some were 22, and then you had, you know, that at the average age was somewhere around the 20s, 19s and 20s. Um, what's exciting about it is that for somebody like myself, we went through the canal. And of course, be, going through the canal is an experience just by itself. Taking a battleship through a canal, can it make it through? And all the experts said that should be not a problem. So going into Panama City or going into Balboa on one side, Panama City on the opposite side, but running through the canal and going through the locks, there was very little space between the locks and the ship as she went through. It was just like it squeezed right on through, but it had no problem. So that in itself was an exciting experience for all the sailors. I mean, first port in, in Panama, going over there, uh, and then coming out was very was was a lot of fun when we came out of the canal on the Pacific side one of the things I remember because I was on a deck at the time is that there were two tin can destroyers coming in from Vietnam and they were like tin cans are very maneuverable and those ships were coming in coming back going over to the East Coast so they were going to go through the canal but as soon as they saw us the, the Jersey come in it's what I call a big dance uh, the two ships start, the two tin cans started doing maneuvers, like showing how sharp they are, how maneuverable they are. And so the captain, which was Schneider at the time, cranked her up and put her into full capacity, and full knot capacity, and then took her through the maneuvers. So it was a dance between a, a battleship out there, low profile, and two tin cans as they went around and maneuver around each other and then ultimately the tin cans came alongside and in respect it said you know that was fun we, we 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 liked the way you look out there and so forth and then they went on their way back over to the Atlantic side and we went and continue on our way up to the uh, Pacific side up to San Francisco because we went up to San Francisco first docked at the um, at the aircraft carrier side of the of the, of the harbor um, it was impressive going under the Golden Gate Bridge, seeing you know that she can clear as you went underneath there, and there was a lot of picture taking. The ship was very prestigious. It was at the time um, very a lot of press coverage. She was had as much prestige as the Enterprise did on an aircraft carrier, 
And the reason I could say that is because having the uniform on and the ship's patch of USS New Jersey, the kind of respect you got from the other sailors in the fleet was amazing. They would like point to you as a guy from the battleship New Jersey. Because you, the only people who used to get that type of respect really was the, someone coming off the Enterprise. Uh, so now we were like right up there on top with everyone else. And in San Francisco, of course, you know, uh, going into it, the, the ship can only go where the aircraft carriers were at because she's so big and docked over there. So that was a nice little experience in San Francisco. And then coming back into Long, uh, Long Beach, that was our home port for the West Coast. Uh, I guess that was her home port as well when she was on, uh, on the Pacific Fleet. But that, that again, was you know, a lot of fun. For someone who's 19 or 20, um, you're experiencing all those things for the first time. And it's through those eyes, you, you, you learn to appreciate a lot of uh, scenarios. And with the crew itself, the crew was very, a lot of morale, even though there was a lot of demonstrations going on and so forth, we really didn't look at that. I mean, everybody knew we had a job to do, and that's what we did, and uh, we said, this is our life. Now, the demonstrations, were they anti-war demonstrations at the time? Yes. When we left Philadelphia, there was a whole fleet of uh, anti-demonstration uh, boats in the harbor trying to block us as we were going out. But of course, you know, the, the harbor patrol, uh, Coast Guard kind of cleared them out of the way. And um, because again, the New Jersey was a symbol. And, and, and it became a symbol throughout the, uh, the, the tour of duty that we went uh, overseas. Um, it generated a lot of negative publicity and a lot of positive publicity at the same time. But the negative side of it was Deanna Ward demonstrations. Uh, whenever she came in, whenever we were ready to go out, uh, we had those as well. Yeah. And it's just something that you kind of just learn to deal with because at the time the country was a little divided. Now you get to Vietnam, and by the way, on the way over to Vietnam, somebody else told me that they think one man might have jumped over the ship somewhere around Hawaii. Did you ever hear of that? Uh, I don't recall if that ever occurred, you know, there, there, there might have been some rumors, but I don't recall that ever occurred uh, at the time. There was, we knew that we, uh, in Philadelphia, we had one person leave the ship, and I think maybe that was because he uh, might have been, uh, had uh, feelings against the war and so forth, but um, I don't recall anybody jumping over the ship or jumping off the ship or so forth. Now you get to Vietnam. What happens when you're on the firing line off the coast of Vietnam? What's life like? What are men talking about, thinking about? It's a, it, it's, it's a mixture of boredom and then high intensity activity. Boredom being that the turrets are now set up into three watches, three eight hour watches. So everyone, when you're on the gun line, a turret number one will be on an eight hour watch, depending on whatever that time frame may be, turret two, turret three, so we keep rotating. So at some point in time, we have the midnight to eight in the morning, someone has the four to midnight, and someone has the regular uh, eight to whatever time frame. Uh, you, a lot of times you're sitting there until the gun assignments come across, and then there's automatically a step up in procedure right away, and then everybody kind of gets scared up, gets your powder bags loaded up, the adrenaline starts flowing, get your shells moving, and then you're in for fire support, and then the guns start firing. And sometimes you'll go in for, if there was a big offensive going on, on, uh, on in Nam, then all three guns were going, and the ship would go to full-blown general quarters. As long as one turret was on watch, along with a couple of five-inch uh, mounts on the side, because everybody, again, rotated, uh, essentially, you know, the rest of the ship was free to do either maintenance, going on, going maintenance on, on, on your workstations. And then if you had a little free time, you might sit down and read a book, do your laundry, or, uh, you know, watch something or play cards. But once uh, a large offensive went on board, then it went into general quarters, then everyone's just geared up and just started going to their battle stations. And then uh, there are times when we would have like two or three, or all three turrets start to fire and fire support. And what was interesting, on occasion, each of the turret had a periscope. So I remember one time um, there was some activity going on offshore because the ship was about a mile offshore. She can go in as close as, as possible, so it was shallow water, um, draft on her. And I remember on a night operation, you could see it off the coast, the periscope. I looked through and you could see the jet, uh, 
I assume they were Navy or Marine jet uh, fighters doing a dive into and with strafing the area and you know activity going on and then you could hear one of our guns shooting off and then uh, you might see something on the on, on the land side of it but that was one thing I kind of experienced uh, when I was up in the gun room at, at the time most of my time was down really in the shell decks and so forth what was the attitude of the men towards their firing on enemy targets and participating actively in a war at the time you know it, it's it, Every scenario is different. I think in, in our case, there was a lot of uh, a lot of adrenaline. I mean, we took it seriously. We we I don't say we enjoyed it because when when you're dealing with an enemy in a distance, you don't see him. So that what I mean is different. There is that you're looking at saying, okay, the coordinates are going to be a bunker a cluster. Or, a group coming in, uh, whatever, and then you're going to be firing at that. So from us, it's like a cheering squad. It's like you're shooting, and then you get back the results of that afterwards. And they'll they'll mark up the turrets and say, okay, you've got X amount of blah 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 dead, or you've got you did this to uh, a, a bunker complex, or you even got a couple of water buffaloes. Occasionally, you get a water buffalo marked up as well because that might have you know casualty of war, so to speak. But the the crew was very very focused and very team oriented. Everybody really worked together well. Um, and surprisingly, I can say that there probably wasn't a lot of friction, at least I could say if it would turn number two, because you had a mixture of people inside there from different areas. I mean, you had the primary gun crews, which were consisted of maybe around 25 people that were responsible for different areas assigned. But then when you went into full boat, um, General quarters, or when you mount, when you did man the uh, the turret, you would be getting in people from the, the deck crew, some people in from the kitchen crew. Uh, it just really depends. Captain Snyder was in charge of the ship at the time. Yes, he Captain was. Captain Ed Snyder. Talk to me a little about Ed Snyder. What do you recall about him? Crew's reaction to him, and so on like that. Captain Snyder was a very good captain. I, I respected him quite a bit um, from what I know of him and. I met him maybe once in the passing. Um, I met him once actually um, when I received, uh, when we came back from Nam and I received a captain's commendation. Of course, that's when I got to shake hands with the man and so forth up front. Um, but uh, he was a very good leader. He was very informative. He was very concerned about the crew. He was always very good about the crew. Um, he was very up on all the politics of, of, at the time. I uh, was fortunate enough, after the fact, to not that long ago, not too long ago, to watch an interview with him on one of the public uh, stations where they did a scenario. Because afterwards, we knew he, when he left the, the Jersey after we came back, we knew he was going to be an admiral. And of course, he ended up being a rear admiral. But looking at him and just looking to see how spry he is and active and not at all showing his age he's still the same impressive individual and the, and the officers underneath him were the same way why did what made him a good leader how did he treat the men how did he command the ship that made him a, a considered effective leader in your eyes a good leader is a communicator. A good leader comes down and mixes with the crew. He doesn't stand above them. He comes down, he works with them. He comes in to see how you're doing. Uh, if, he, if he's there, if you're welding, he's coming in behind you. He comes in, he's a little bit of a hands-on person, but he gains your respect. Um, he wasn't above standoffish or so forth. He listened to everyone, and that, and that was important. And he communicated a lot, and a good leader is that type of an individual and he has the sense and the respect uh, that follows with him and of course the, the decision processes are as well I mean that, that's all part of that whole scenario so that you know you gain the, the confidence of the men by the way you respond to them and by the way you provide direction and it's not like you're condescending or looking down you're saying okay this is my job this is your job we've got this to do this together I'll help you where I can I can't do this, but of course I can get people to help you to do this. And he did that. Um, when the ship was um, taken off the firing line, it went back to Japan, I understand, for some little bit of R&R &R and refitting. Uh, 
what did you experience in Japan? What did you see reactions of the people to the battleship New Jersey? We went to a number of places. We went to Yokosuka. We went to Yokosuka in, in Japan, which a couple of times there. Uh, we went to Singapore. We weren't supposed. We were to go to Hong Kong, but because of the political nature going on, uh, we couldn't go there. We had to go to, to Singapore. The people themselves were respectful as long as you were respectful of them. Okay. Um, Actually, uh, again, you know, we were, our, our ports of liberty were uh, Yokosuka, Japan, uh, Singapore, and then, of course, uh, Subic Bay. That was our, our, our other port that we hit quite a bit. Uh, most of the people were tolerant of, of, the, of the New Jersey, especially in Japan. Uh, Japan was very nice, and I think one of the things and it was by individuals, really how you reacted. And that was a good learning experience in going across the world and traveling, for, especially for a youngster, because you, know, you can come across as an American as arrogant, but then as you start dealing with the local populations and so forth, you, you learn to gather their respect, because as long as you respect their culture, everybody gets along quite well. Uh, there wasn't really anything negative, uh, any experiences, negative experiences, really, in uh, in Yokosuka or in Singapore and Subic Bay and in, in these ports. Uh, it was more of a very good learning experience. Uh, again, we were always big press no matter wherever we went into. Uh, we were supposed to go to Hong Kong, but they pushed us through Singapore because of the of the, the conflict going up in Vietnam and the Chinese were all up in arms at, this, at that point in time. Uh, and that also did cause some issues. We knew it caused issues when we were off the coast of Vietnam as well. But the Liberty ports were excellent. They were fun. I mean, it was good learning. From, for myself, chance to go to Tokyo, just to look around, go to the Imperial Palace, uh, experience the sights of Tokyo, experience the the, the bullet train and the mixture of the people and just how things were crowded. In Singapore, again, it was a whole different scenario. It brought new respect for a different culture, just to, to see how well and modernized the cultures were. And you kind of learn things. I think one of my f more favorite experiences in Singapore was, and I didn't really know this, is that I was always taking a lot of pictures. I took a picture of, uh, of a vendor and all of a sudden, that vendor was like chasing me down the street, and I couldn't understand why, and they were like throwing things at me. But I realized later on that that was a no-no because I had captured their spirit, and I wasn't supposed to do that. But in some ways, it was uh, kind of funny, but in other ways, you know, you, you said, okay, well, I'll never do that again. So you learned that stuff. Uh, you learned to deal with the mixture of the, of the cultures. Uh, in the Philippines, Subic Bay, it, it's, it was a typical Navy base. There was a lot of things going on there. Uh, getting into Manila was a little bit different. Every country is different. Uh, but the experiences were very good. The people were good. So, you know, they appreciated us as you were closer to the base. Of course, and they didn't appreciate us if you caused problems. I've interviewed, talked to one person who was a pharmacist made aboard the ship during Vietnam, and he said Subic Bay is, was loaded with diseases and sicknesses. Did you experience anything like that? The, did the ship command talk about being careful when you're in Subic Bay, uh, where to go and so on like that when you're sure? In, in Subic Bay, it's a typical naval base, yes. It's loaded with uh, diseases and so forth. I mean, basically, as soon as you left port, there was always a line up outside the pharmacist's office for shots and pills and so forth. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, you can run into that. Um, it's very easy to run into that. Uh, so, you, know, you were running into that even if you went into certain points in uh, parts in uh, Japan as well. There, there are you know the, the areas that cater to sailors and s as well as you would be in Singapore if you went to Thailand for that matter. So now you stayed aboard the ship until it's uh, it was decommissioned. I stayed aboard the ship um, w once we brought her back after her tour of duty and and now we put, I brought her back into uh, Long Beach. Uh, I stayed on board the ship prior to her going up to Bremington for decommissioning. And what was the attitude of the crew uh, when they found out the ship would be decommissioned and not go back to Vietnam? The crew was um, disappointed. 
uh, there was a lot of disappointment in there because the ship was expected to come back in, sit for a couple of months, and then go back into uh, the, the gun line in Vietnam. But a lot of that was political, and the reason for the decommissioning was very political. Uh, and I learned this more after the fact. I suspected it probably back then, but I learned more of it after the fact. But the crew was demoralized. You start switching out people that were veterans like myself on, on board the ship that come off the gun line, and you had new people coming on board that were ready to do so. But then they were disappointed because now that their jobs were going to be to take this ship up to Washington and decommission her. Now, you said both then, especially later, you thought the decision to to decommission a ship was political. What do you mean by political and why do you say that? Because after the fact, um, one, of the, one of the things that in the, in the gun line that we experienced, we ran up the coast of Vietnam, up around the South China Sea, and we were firing, doing a lot of fire support because we were going up as far into North Vietnam as we could. And if we could do any, uh, any type of damage, we would do that. Um, what was going on at the time that we didn't know about and I learned later is that there were talks about a, uh, a peace accord for Vietnam. And so the last thing they needed to have was this battleship sitting off the battle line going up there and bombarding parts of North Vietnam and going in towards Hanoi and so forth. So there was a lot of pressure. Well, Kessinger was uh, at the point of time was uh, the chief uh, uh, the negotiator, mediator, and I remember picking this up from an interview after the fact on a PBS station with Schneider, Captain Schneider, or Admiral Schneider, and he indicated the same thing, that we were up and running along the coast of Vietnam, North Vietnam, we were doing artillery support, causing a lot of havoc, and all of a sudden these talks were going on and we were told, or he was directed to turn that ship and get it out of there because you were starting to muddy up the waters of, uh, of the negotiations. So. I think at that point in time, one of the things that um, uh, caused the early decommissioning was the political scene because there were peace negotiations underway in the early stages. And the one thing that you didn't want to do is have a big presence of a, of a battleship. And a battleship is a major presence. Is outdated as a battleship may seem, it is when you go up into foreign ports, it, it automatically just brings out maybe the ugliness of the past as well as, you know, the powerfulness of a nation because battleships were considered gunboats and major gunboats and they were very arrogant and that caused some issues. So, like I said before, we did get a lot of screenplay, uh, a lot of screenplay, a lot of pictures in the front pages and so forth. Uh, there was a lot of um, screening of the, plane, of, the, of the ship by Russian uh, bear bombers. We have got pictures of those where we were just escorted and they come in for pictures and so forth uh, as this was all going on. Um, so it was very political and I, that's why I feel that uh, later on it confirmed it that the early decommissioning in Vietnam was a result of the, of, the, of the Paris peace talks that were going on. Now moving on, looking back, how did, I quite often ask people, how did your experiences aboard the battleship in New Jersey impact your life? 10, 20 years later, 30 years later? It makes me more focused. I think one of the things that it does, and when you're a young person, confidence is kind of something that you're looking to do, to get the grasp for. You're trying to find yourself, you're trying to get that footing and so forth. I think the first buildup was being chosen to be picked on board the ship. Because the play was, you're going to be a few, hand few, handful of a few people among many and you're only going to be selected aboard the ship because there's something about you, a talent or whatever, that will guarantee you duty on board the ship. And putting your name in as a volunteer among how many volunteers that are out there at the time, whether it's 10,000 or 20,000 people and to be one person to be picked is quite impressive. That kind of like says, okay, well there's something about me. And when you get in with the crew, Again, you mixed with people that are fairly smart and intelligent, and you kind of wonder why are they here, and but then you understand why you're here as well. Um, problem solving became part of the, the scenario, and also becoming more focused and team oriented. Uh, I guess it, in a way for myself, it said I, I develop an attitude that you can do anything you want. You can change and take charge of your life, 
and that's really what I looked at. One of the reasons when I had joined the Navy was there was the drafts were going on, and I said, well, why should I leave this up to random? At least if I'm going to do something, let me pick where I'm going to go. And because I was 17, I says, well, I can at least dictate going for three years versus four years. If I draft, if I get drafted, it's two years. So those the early stages were more like taking charge and direction of your life and then moving forward. So on board the New Jersey, you become more confident and you get involved with the problem solving and working under pressure and under, you know, uh, extreme conditions sometimes. Um, and then coming into the low periods, you, t you take charge of your life. And that's for myself is was take charge of your situation. Um, I was in the Navy less than three years because I decided to go back to college. And so what I did is I applied to a number of schools prior to leaving for Vietnam, our duty on board the ship, and with the idea that I might be able to get out a little bit early and go back to school. And while I was on board the ship, I did try to take some um, correspondent courses. But I think the biggest thing coming out of there is that I learned that you can take charge of your life. You can change the direction as much as you can. Why let fate take, why throw yourself to, to fate? Provide that direction. And what did you do later in life? You finished college with what type of degree and what happens later? Well, later on, I got out of school. I mean, I, I graduated with a, a, a bachelor in science and business administration. Uh, immediately went to work, uh, worked for... Reynolds and Reynolds for about a year into sales. I went into mobile oil as a credit analyst for them for a number of years. And then I went to Johnson & Johnson and got back into operations. And really, operations was my forte. I stayed with them before I went back. I, I met, uh, got work with the Baxter Healthcare Corporation. So in going into Baxter, I immediately just started taking the same thought pattern. So taking charge of my career, taking charge of my life and got myself promoted in a couple of years and went out to the West Coast and stayed out in the LA area for about seven years. While I was out there, I, I decided to take on a master's program. And so I graduated from Pepperdine University with a master's in business administration while working full time. And I did that in about two years, uh, going to classes at night. And that in itself was a full time experience. But I guess the experience of working 24-7 on board a battleship and, you know, paying, I paid for everything myself. I got no scholarships, uh, no support, so I paid everything for myself. And uh, the only kind of support I got was really from Baxter for the, the master's program. As long as you maintain a certain grade point average, and of course for a master's program you have to have a B and above in order to graduate. That's what I did, and of course that took care of it. But. Uh, it made me more focused and take charge, and through that I'm able to try to direct myself in my careers. While I was going through this, I experienced a number of uh, increases in responsibility. And then uh, when we went through consolidations of companies and you get put on waivers, as I like to call it, then you started saying, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to sit there and just take it, or am I going to go out and try to find something else? And so I did. I landed up moving from L.A. to sh New Jersey. Um, and then stayed with that, that division and brought up a whole new business group and got promoted again. And then became in charge of various projects to build uh, new facilities. And then when I decided I didn't want to move up into the boondocks in New York, I left Baxter, took a vacation for five years and supplied all the hospitals in New York City and took on a general manager's position. And then when that gig was coming up, I got back into Baxter again. Now I'm a director of logistics for Baxter, global logistics. Uh, built a new warehouse about two years ago. It's gonna be a legacy for myself uh, down in Memphis. And now I deal with people all over the world. I just got back from a conference just yesterday and down in Miami. And the folks that I've sat down there and I deal with are in India, Japan, China, all these other places. So I think my experience is out of in the Navy and on board to New Jersey were very positive. It just kind of set myself to be very focused and uh, very oriented towards achievement. Because when I was in the Navy, when I was in New Jersey, I came in as just a seaman apprentice. But I left in less than three years as a gunner's mate third class. I made an E-4. Not too many people do that that quick. They usually stick around for three years or so, become from an E-3 to an E-4, move that up. 
Uh, so one of the few people was able to do that. Very good. Um, is there anything else I should have asked, talked about in this interview that you think is important that should be mentioned for the historical record? New Jersey was, the, the life of New Jersey was, like I said, both mundane, at times boring, and then there was a lot of high intensity activity. I think other things that happened on board there, the experiences, we had a Bob Hope Christmas show on board the ship. And they flew in everyone, including Bob Hope. So, I mean, got long range pictures of Bob Hope but on board the ship, but that was a Christmas show. Uh, on board the New Jersey, that was excellent. You know, it was one of the more positive experiences. Experiencing the ship going through small storms or typhoons. I mean, watching how the ship ro rode out a storm. Uh, you were not uh, allowed to go out on certain decks, but if you wanted to see the fury of Mother Nature, you can go up to the, f the topmost upper point on the mass in a closed environment, and then you can peek your head out there and you just see the, you know, the, the storms and how they are and the waves breaking over the ship and how she's riding through it. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, there's probably a lot of experiences, but I think those sit out in my mind as the most, the most very important things. And then just sitting out there one time in between a break and looking out at the horizon and seeing nothing but maybe a, a squall or the sunset going out that way. It kind of puts you, you know, gives you time to reflect and say, okay, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Because this is nice. But this is not going to be forever. So all in all, was it a positive experience serving on the battleship in Jersey? Negative, neutral? For myself, it's a very positive experience. I have a lot of pictures from it, a lot of memories, and uh, I think in a lot of ways it's very helpful for me. It, it provided a little bit more direction, or at least gave me the, 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 the blueprints to start moving. Uh, the shelves are about 2,000 pounds, and of course, a lot of this was all manual work, moving this around the shell decks and moving these up here on the wood decks as well, or the teak decks. But on the shell decks, it was very interesting because in order to move this, it was all moving by uh, winches and ropes. You wrapped a rope down on the bottom, the deck itself was stainless steel, and you polished those every day, and then you put in a real thin layer of oil for mobility, and then what you would do is just wrap a a line around the bottom of the shell and then with a hoist you would just move it and they, these things would just move around. So you'd be moving this 2,000 pound shell by uh, hoist power and by ropes and oil. So that was one of the ways to handle this shell below decks. Uh, the gunpowder was interesting because it came in canisters of three. So each one of these bags weighs 100 pounds and of course when you're loading uh, the powder on the elevators to go up to the gun rooms. Every man that's down in the, in the powder room, and there was quite a few people in the powder room, it was really more like a, uh, a bucket brigade. 100 pound bag, you hand it on to the next guy and keep handing it to the next guy. So you learn to handle the 100 pound bags very quickly, move them to the elevators, and then uh, get six bags up in the elevators to the gun room, and then the shell would be up there. So the shell would be pushed into the breach. The gun, and then behind it would come six bags. And then down in the gun pit would be one guy who's got a, while the, the, the breach is open, the, would be putting in a primer shell underneath. And then now what we, once they close the, uh, the, the breach on the gun and she came into position, then of course the firing pin would be there and then that would set off the gun and you, you can watch it uh, recoil back towards you. Very interesting experiences on the gun rooms. Uh, we're in Terra 2 gun room now, and my position was down in the gun pits over here at the uh, furthest left uh, gun uh, location. Uh, my job was to insert the primer into the breech as the gun came into the load position, so the breech would drop down. It would eject the, cart the spent cartridge, and I'd go ahead and put in a new live cartridge. Meantime, up in the, in the actual room, the, the operators would be uh, on the hoist and on the cradle would be positioning the shell as she came up the elevator. It would position, lay it down, and then they would like push her in and then they open up the doors for the elevators for the gun bags and then three bags would roll out and then the, the, the plunger would push it in and then again three more would come out and then push it all the way in and then at that point in time when, when they were set the breach would close and then the gun would come into position and then go ahead and fire and myself being in the gun pit 
I would be able to sit down in a little cubbyhole corner and I would actually watch the gun recoil back to me. So that's just the experience of that is like looking at a uh, subway uh, car coming at you or a uh, freight train coming right at you, but only it stops and then it can, you know, comes right back into position again and then the process would uh, continue. It may seem like a lengthy process, but we were able to, to spit off two shells a minute, two rounds a minute, and that's pretty quick for a 16-inch gun, 30 seconds entirely, and we were always trying to beat that record. Uh, these are periscopes in, on the deck, and they're more, more or less used by the officer or the, uh, the, the gunner's mate, first class gunner's mate, to uh, take a look at positions, gather position, any information for uh, the gyroscopes, which were back here. You had a crew of men in the back here. All of this was semi-automated, computerized, but not computerized like the way we did, uh, but basically put in all the positions so that the guns would be able to be fired and the shells would be accurately uh, shot at a maximum of 20 some miles. Uh, and the shells were fairly accurate. But again, these are the periscopes and these work very good for uh, also making sure that um, the, you, the, the targets and everything else was followed correctly and so forth. Uh, these are the entryways into the various gun rooms and of course they're all tiny and very small going into and you see a lot of brass work and a lot of gauges around and all these gauges were read you know meticulously to be sure that the right pressures were at the right point when the when the guns were in action uh, very tight areas this one little table here actually this is where our coffee pot was at you know everybody used to drink a lot of coffee in the navy especially in the gun rooms especially if you're in, on watch at uh, one o'clock in the morning three o'clock in the morning you got to keep the coffee going and this is where the coffee was placed at um, tight area very thick very thick uh, shelling in here are probably around 16 24 inches of steel right above us and of course Everything is white and everything was meticulously clean along with the brass work as well.